Alright, it's a beautiful day for another episode of Outside the Letterbox. I'm Joe, and with me is uh, Letterbox regular and uh, fellow podcaster, article writer, Nick. Hey everyone, happy uh, May the 4th. Happy May the 4th! That's when we're recording this on. It's it's awesome. It's Star Wars Day. I'm doing my my annual uh, rewatch of of the original trilogy anyway. I can never... <clears throat> Not that I have anything against the prequels, but I just can't bring myself to watch six Star Wars movies in a single day. I could, I could do the original trilogy, but I can't do uh, the whole saga at this point. You know, you know, I've, I've actually done that before. There, there was a uh, there was a year or two where uh, it was it was a tra- tradition for for me and some friends of mine uh, when I was in high school. We used to marathon all the Star Wars movies in one day. You know, I, was... I remember in college at one point we decided we were going to marathon the Star Wars movies, but we decided to do it not in any order like it was just gonna be random it was like oh we'll watch episode five and then episode two and then episode and it was a very strange experience because i think uh you know you're either used to watching like just your favorite at one particular time or like just the original trilogy or just the prequels or kind of going one two three four five six or you know four five six one two three so to like just go in random order was just like this doesn't make sense and yet this is awesome and i have no idea what my mind is feeling right now and try to make it make sense. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we're we're not here to talk about Star Wars today. We have a a, 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 a different Disney property. We're gonna be. Well, uh, talking I mean, about. we still are gonna talk about Star Wars, but that's not the, that's well, not the focus of this episode. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, the the uh, the main topic that we'll eventually get to at some point after we talk about Star Wars is uh, the new Marvel blockbuster Avengers: Age of Ultron, which I'm sure everyone's seen by now. It was actually a little bit annoying because I, I wasn't able to see this until Sunday. Um, and like everybody I knew went to go see it Thursday night. I was like, damn it. I feel like I'm so behind. And it's yeah, just like, I, we've been barely out for 24 hours. Yeah. I had to see it Thursday night because I was, I was busy this weekend and my younger brother was already going to be seeing it and he's on the East coast. So he's three hours ahead of me. So pretty much when I would be entering the theater, he would be leaving it. So I was like, well, okay, I want to be able to talk to him about this and go figure, you know, I obviously I, I, I get out of the movie and then, you know, the next day rolls around. And before I even have a chance to talk to him about it, he's already seen it a second time on Friday. <laughs> That's ridiculous. It's just, it, it's just crazy. We we now live in a world where if you don't see a movie within like a few hours of its premiere, you're behind the times and you're risk well, getting spoilers. <laughs> the interesting conversation that comes up about spoilers and stuff like that and, and when to post them. And I I don't think anyone has, has come up with an official, you know, like this is it. This is the rules we're all going to abide by. But I've, I found, uh, I think it was on Screen Junkies, they had an episode where they talked about spoilers, and the consensus they came to was, if it's a movie, wait two weeks. If it's a TV show, you only have two days. And I think the logic behind that, and it's, I mean, with TV, it's not as exact anymore, because, uh, especially with Netflix and how they release, like, all their seasons at one time, but generally the way TV kind of works is it's, you know, hey, this is on Sunday night at 9 o'clock. Yeah, you can watch it afterwards, but it's a, you know, there's a very specific time when this thing is on. So pretty much two days after that, it shouldn't be a huge deal um, if things get spoiled or not. And the same thing with the movie. Like, obviously, I think you got to take a lot of courtesy into effect. Like, if I'm having a conversation with someone about Breaking Bad and I know someone right next to me is, like, still making their way through it, like, just be courteous and don't go, you know, go, go out of your way to avoid, you know, dropping big spoilers. Yeah, exactly. It, it's just It's just... It's just common courtesy. There are people out there who haven't seen it yet, but I'm like, you should be able to discuss it with the people you have seen it with. Yeah. Um, so that's gonna be our main topic uh, today. Um, just a quick rundown of how this how guess is gonna go. Uh, as usual, we'll talk about our uh, uh, briefly about a, a few movies that uh, Nick and I have seen recently. Some uh, some older movies. I think is on both of our lists. Um, then we'll move into current film news, uh, a couple of topics uh, that's come up in the past week, and then we'll finally move on to our main topic, which is Avengers Age of Ultron. Um, if you're more interested in one thing or the other, you can skip around. Um, in the uh, description of this video, you, you can see a little, a little timeline that'll, that'll outline when we start talking about each section, so you can skip around uh, if you're more interested in one thing or the other. Um, and then finally, before we get started, uh, you can uh, find more episodes of Outside the Letterbox on our website, the-letterbox.com. You can leave a comment, subscribe to us on YouTube, all that good, fun stuff. You can also follow us on Twitter at Letterboxers, and uh, stay up to date with us on Facebook at The Letterbox. So, let's kick this, let's kick this off with uh, recent watches. Nick, 
what have you been watching lately? Well, I saw uh, Willow for the first time, which uh, surprises me because, um, I mean, it's a, it's a George Lucas production, and, you know, obviously, if you couldn't tell already, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, huge Indiana Jones fan, so, you know, pretty much anything that George Lucas has, has brought us for the most part, I've been a pr- pretty big fan of. Um, and it's, you know, it's an 80s fantasy movie, and, and I kind of grew up in an era when, when those have been out for a few years or, or whatever, but they were shown on TV all the time, or people had recorded them off TV. And for some reason, Willow was just one I hadn't uh, seen. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think I've had an, enough friends who have seen it and liked it, and it's, you know, enough of the, you know, enough of it is like out there in pop culture that I recognize certain elements of it that was like, all right, I should finally sit down and watch this. So I did the other night and uh, it's not a perfect movie, but I actually found myself enjoying it quite a bit. Um, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting movie because uh, George Lucas kind of made Willow because he couldn't get the rights to The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. And it's weird because there are shots in, in this movie that it's like, wait, did Peter Jackson watch this and then just lift it and put it in The Lord of the Rings? Because there's some... There's some shots of when like a group of characters is traveling. It's like that's totally the Fellowship traveling, you know, <laughs> in the Lord of the Rings movies or whatever. Um, especially for a movie that is 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 coming up on 30 years, like it looks really good. Um, I, I was watching the recent, I guess, HD remaster that came out like a year or two ago, and it looks really good. Yeah, you know, you know, I I, I surprisingly hadn't heard of Willow until um, um, I actually went to went went to college. Um, where my 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 then girlfriend, now my wife, uh, she absolutely loves that movie, um, and she's like, "Oh man, you have to watch Willow." And I remember, and, you know, I don't remember much about it, but I remember watching it and being pretty unimpressed. Uh, I mean, yeah. Really surprising, considering your taste in movies. <laughs> I know. I mean, like maybe I need to watch it again. It's been it's been probably about like what four or five years since I watched it now, um, and all I remember was. Uh, uh, Val Kilmer is in that, isn't he? Yeah, he's really good in that. Yeah, I remember Val Kilmer. I remember, I remember Warwick Davis, and I remember a stop motion giant creature that they call a dragon at the end. Yeah, it's really. I guess it, <laughs> I guess it technically is a dragon, although its face looks closer to like one of those weird Star Wars aliens than it yeah. does a traditional fantasy dragon. Yeah, exactly. So I need, I need to watch it again. Um, because for some reason, whenever someone says Willow, the first thing that pops to mind is Legend uh, by Ridley yeah. Scott, which are two completely different movies. But I think I watched yeah. them around the same time. Yeah, Tim Tim Curry is not in this movie. One <laughs> <laughs> can only wish. <laughs> yeah, um, I I will I will give it to you though. Uh, the movie is it, it's it's a little over two hours long, which you know I mean we're going to talk about Age of Ultron is a much longer movie, but I you know that's a movie that I don't think fills its length because I think it, it fills it up accordingly whereas whereas willow is a movie that's like it probably could have been tightened a little bit because there's a lot of uh um you know you know the whole movie is like a journey but then the last act is kind of a, a final battle and it feels like oh it would have been nice if you know the journey part had been shorter or like other more significant things had happened along the road or, or whatever um yeah I, I think almost the movie works better as a collection of great moments than as just like a cohesive film but I, but I, I still think it was a really enjoyable experience. Nice. Well, that's one I'll have to check out again at some point. Um, and then, and then, and then, is that all you got for, for your recent watches? Yeah, I mean, I've, been, I, I've watched a, a couple other things. Like, like I watched Eraserhead. I watched Scanners. <laughs> I watched, I watched a lot of weird movies this past week. And Willow was really when I looked at the list of stuff I'd watched, I was like, Willow is the only one that I really want to talk about. <laughs> you don't want to blow our minds yet. No. no. Uh, uh, anyway, um, um, I actually haven't had a whole lot of time for 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 very many movies, but um, I think we'll fit a couple in this past week. Uh, one of them was uh, I finally watched Rushmore, which I've been meaning to get around to for a while. Um, I, I I still consider myself a fairly recent uh, Wes Anderson. I don't even know what you want to call it. I'm not quite. I wouldn't quite call myself a fan, but I've I've recently been discovering his works. I've been watching his films for a couple of years now, but it's been kind of slowly over amount of time where I'm, where I feel like I'm still fairly new to him. Which ones um, haven't you watched yet? Uh, I don't even, you know, you know what, you know what, let me, let me pull, pull up a list of his, uh, his movies here. Cause there's only a few, I think at this point, I think I've seen most of his movies by now. Um, I've seen most of Bottle Rocket. I've seen Rushmore. I've seen Royal Tenenbaums. I have not seen Life Aquatic. Um, 
and I have not seen Moonrise Kingdom. I've seen all his other stuff though. Oh, okay. So I I would recommend watching this. It's actually funny is uh, Life Aquatic seems to be a pretty uh, divisive movie. Like you know, a lot of people like it or a lot of people don't like it. Um, and Moonrise Kingdom I think is one of one of his best movies. So I, I would recommend checking out both. Yeah, which, which, which is funny that I haven't seen Moonrise Kingdom because um, that was the one that I I wanted to see even before I knew who Wes Anderson was. I remember seeing trailers for that movie and thinking, oh, that looks pretty funny. I want to check that out. Yeah. So I need to get around to it. But um, I'm not going to lie. I, I'm not the biggest fan of Rushmore. Um, I know it's considered one of his better movies. A lot of people love it. Um, I can see why. Uh, the, the, the dynamic between Bill Murray and Jason Schwartzman is really kind of, kind of the highlights of the movie. Um, and the movie has this kind of whimsical attitude that Wes Anderson usually has, but I don't know. I don't know. For me, for me, I, I think I need to think about it a little bit more. I didn't hate the movie. I didn't, I wouldn't even say I really disliked it a whole lot. I just kind of watched it and kind of finished it. And I, was like, I, I, I don't know what to think about this movie very much. Um, I think, I think, I, I think I just have, a, have, have problems with, with, with movies where the main character is an asshole. <laughs> and unless I mean, like, like a movie like like Ghostbusters, Bill Murray's an asshole in that movie, but I still like Ghostbusters. He's still likable enough. Whereas this one, Jason Schwartzman, I'm just kind of like every time he's on the screen, I'm just like, I just want to tell him just just stop, just just stop, please. Uh, I'll I'll give you uh, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt because uh, the first time I watched a lot of Wes Anderson's movies like Rushmore and Royal Tenenbaums, like I didn't care for those as much. But then going back and rewatch, it clicked for me um, yeah. on a lot of them. And, and just for me, Rushmore, I mean, I know you have, it seems like you have problems that are more ingrained into the plot and character of the movie, and it's been over a year since I've watched it, so I don't want to, I don't want to try to defend it and you know, <laughs> after the fact that, oh, I completely uh, misremembered this plot point or, or whatever. But for, for me, I, I just think it's kind of a, you know, there's kind of like a litany of perfectly timed visual gags and sarcastic line deliveries that are just, I, I I just think it's one of his most consistently funny movies. I remember, uh, like, still, I I've seen it a couple times now, and just like every time, it's it's one of his movies that I laugh out loud the most. I think, you know, like like a yeah. lot of Wes Anderson movies, kind of like I I'll, I'll like always have a smile on my face or I'll always be like chuckling or something like that. Rushmore to me is the one where I'm just I'm laughing out loud the whole time, which is great. Most. Most Wes Anderson movies, are about, most Wes Anderson movies are like that anyway. He, 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 I can't deny the guy really has a great sense of humor, especially visual humor that comes through really well. It even comes really comes through really really well in Rushmore, which is why I think I can't quite hate the movie, despite the problems I might have with the so, so, some of the some of the themes and character decisions. Um, because the movie is again, it's it's a very very well made movie, and uh, uh, he uses visual humor in a really great way in that one. Yeah. So so this is what I would recommend. I would say watch Moonrise Kingdom and uh, Life Aquatic and then give it a give it a little bit of time and then rewatch all of his movies like not you don't have to do like back to back to back but like every other movie you watch for like a week or you know or whatever just like go back and re revisit his things because I think his movies uh, more than a lot of other filmmakers really um, improve on rewatches even, even the ones that I've come out and been like, that was a great movie, have improved. Like Grand Budapest Hotel, first time I saw it, was like, oh, that was a really good movie. And then, you know, even though uh, my opinion didn't change quite as much on the rewatch, it was still like, oh, that was even better than the first time I saw it. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, take, I'll have to take that into account. Maybe maybe, maybe, maybe write a, an article ranking West Anderson's movies after I've gone through and seen them all. Yeah. Um, and then one other movie that I want to talk briefly on is one that I should have seen a long, long time ago. Uh, Big Trouble in Little China yes. by John Carpenter. Oh my gosh! I again, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt on this one because um, usually I, I think when any of us watch a movie, you know, like I've watched a lot of movies because you recommended them to me, or you know, you watched a couple that I've recommended to you. But like, or it's just like this huge list of movies that everyone says is great. You eventually get around to it. But this was this was one that, and I'm a pretty big John Carpenter fan. Like I think The Thing is is one of the best movies ever made. Um, but Big Trouble in Little China, I think, is the one I would watch the most just because of how fun it is. And it was one that just, I remember one day getting a text from my brothers and just being like, we just randomly watched this movie called Big Trouble in Little China. You have to watch it now. <laughs> and I was like, okay, whatever. It's on Netflix. And I remember watching it and being like, why didn't like anyone tell me to watch this like sooner? Like, <laughs> I can't believe I went so many years without watching it. 
this movie has been sitting in my Netflix queue forever. And so I finally just like on a win the other day, just, just, just started watching it. And I am so glad I did. Um, I've been thinking more recently that, 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 that John Carpenter is, is, is slowly becoming one of my favorite directors. Ever since I watched Assault on Precinct 13, I was thinking about his movies. And I'm like, you know what? I consistently like his movies a lot. Like I like his, his uh, Assault on Precinct 13 a lot. I like the thing a lot. Um, I, I love Escape from New York. So watching this movie at, at this point, I think I can firmly say John Carpenter is, I think, one of my favorite directors, just because he's so saturated in the in the eighties. Um, just his, his his amazing soundtracks with that 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 dark pulsing theme theme song music, um, and the and 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 his heroes are consistently just like like John McClane esque, you know, just like regular dudes thrown into these situations, uh, which you don't see any more evident than in Big Trouble in Little China with Kurt Russell running around in little China or, or in, uh, in <laughs> running around in Chinatown, just looking at all these crazy kind of mystical, uh, you know, people shooting lightning out of their, out of their hands and that kind of stuff. Just kind of looking at like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to roll with it. <laughs> yeah. It's so good. It's so good. Um, yeah. They, that's, that's, and I, we've talked about it like that, you know, if I ever come back on film literate, that's like my number one choice to do that movie um it's we, there's, so, there's so much there's so much great entertaining stuff to do with it i'm sure you and the editing could come up with uh some great stuff uh i have to ask um there, there's a song in the end credits that's by john carpenter's band have you watched the music video by any chance i have not yet it is the epitome of 80s cheese in the best way possible um at, after this is all done you you gotta look it up I'll definitely will. I'll I, definitely I, that. Right I, now, I'm going to send you the link so you can watch it later. <laughs> I'll watch it during the podcast. No, <laughs> awesome. So anyway, I think that about wraps it up as far as our, our, our recent watches. Uh, just moving on to a couple of uh, film news items. We actually don't have a whole lot this week. Um, no trailers for once. <laughs> Yay, thank goodness. I mean, not thank goodness, but... <laughs> We had we had a, a I think an overload of trailers in our, in, our, in our last episode so 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 this week we'll 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 be a little more kind to our to our listeners. Um, first off, uh, this is May the fourth, um, which is Star Wars Day, um, and actually, you know what? Most of our new news is Star Wars related, oddly yeah. enough. Uh, so first off, they they they, they released some some new photos, um, some some cast and set photos from the uh, Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens, um, which I just had a chance to look at for the first time a few minutes ago before we started doing this, actually. Um, and you get to see what's his name, Kylo Ren, the guy with the with the face mask and the 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 crossblade lightsaber. Yeah. Without his mask. And he looks like Adam Driver. He looks, I don't know, I, I don't know, just just for me, it looks like a bad Photoshop job for some reason, just, well, just, I think just kind of the way he contrasts against the background. <laughs> yeah, I think they probably took, I, I, it's, it's possible they didn't take the, because there are a couple uh, snow troopers behind him, and it's possible that they took the two photos separately, or they took one photo and then realized, oh, hey, we want to actually get a better look at, you know, Adam Driver, and so they, like, upped the contrast. So that you could see him better, um, <laughs> but yeah, I you know, like I get it. But it, yeah, I think he gets the point across and and confirms because and this is one of the things you know. I, I love speculation. I love you know trying to piece two different things together. Like I remember when that new trailer came out. Uh, you know, my brothers and I were just sending back all these different theories of what we thought all the the shots meant and connected and whatever. But one of the things that I always kind of hate is when when people kind of insist on certain things. And it's like, no, guys, you're, you're totally wrong. So, like, everyone for the longest time was denying that Kylo Ren was played by Adam Driver. And they were like, oh, my gosh, Kylo Ren is probably Luke. Or, like, oh, it's the character played by Gwendolyn Christie. And so I'm glad today we can finally say, no, Adam Driver's playing Kylo Ren and Gwendolyn Christie is playing Captain Phasma. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> kind of definitively, like, unless, the, unless, you know, they're really trolling us and they pull a switcheroo in the movie, you know, it is what it is. So Exactly. Um, um, a couple of things that stood out to me about these these photos. One is uh, uh, Lupita Nyong'o is is once again playing a a, a uh, motion capture character. Um, is 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 it, is it just me or is she or is she kind of kind of kind of been typecast as 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 like the new um, uh, Andy Serkis? <laughs> oh, because of her work in Jungle Book. Yeah, that's possible. Um, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. A lot of people were kind of disappointed that they're like, oh, like her character won't be, you know, uh, 
a puppet or a muppet or or whatever and i'm i'm okay with it like i you know like as much as there's part of me that was like wouldn't it be awesome if like the force awakens was, was like the ultimate retro movie i realized that you know the whole thing about star wars though is is you know it was it was always grounded but at the same time it was still um pushing special effects forward so i so i think this is a good mix then like I, as you can see there's that whole photo of people from the the pirate hideout or whatever that's clearly all practical stuff and so it's like we're gonna have more than enough of that so if we have a couple characters that are, are cg i'm perfectly okay with it yeah exactly and, and 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 i mean like not to bring up the prequels but i mean star wars has has always done that they've always brought in you know cgi characters and that kind of stuff and we've seen enough practical effects from this one and again like i said from that cast photo all those practical puppet and creature effects that I have no problem with them merging CG with practical, which I actually think is the best way to use visual effects in general. Um, I think yeah, you get the best overall look. Yeah, and I mean, say what you will about Jar Jar Binks, but he doesn't look bad in those movies at all. Yeah, you know? exactly. For the time, at least. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we also get our, 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 our one shot of the, uh, is this the chrome trooper that we saw in the uh, the trailer? Yeah, Captain Phasma, played by... Gwendolyn Christie of Game of Thrones fame, and if, and you know she plays she plays uh, in, in Game of Thrones she she plays a, a female knight who's very you know not quite as feminine and is kind of just a, an all around badass. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how close or how different uh, this character is to that character. Um, but it makes me really happy that she's actually playing it because one she's a great actress. And two, I guess the part was originally uh, written for a man, and then they were kind of like, "Oh, why don't we just cast her in it?" Because you know, it doesn't need to be a man necessarily. So, uh, I'm really looking forward to to what she brings to the role. I just love the look, and I'm looking forward to seeing scenes with with her and uh, C3PO in the scene together, so that they have to try to hide as many reflective uh, shots oh. of the cast and crew as possible. <laughs> that, that that's where the um, lens flare comes in. <laughs> so many lens. Oh my gosh. Oh no. So many lens flares now with these characters, I just realized. <laughs> um, anyway, those are kind of the, 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 the standouts from the photos um, um, to me. I don't know if anything else jumped out at you as, as far as they're, they're concerned. No, I mean, I, I do like in that, the, the photo of all the different creatures and stuff. Um, that, as far as I can tell, those are all brand new creatures like that haven't appeared in any of the new movies. And that's that's always kind of the... You know, growing up when when the prequels were coming out, that was one of my favorite things. Was oh, here's this new alien, you know, that we're getting, and I wonder, you know, what what planet it's from, or like what you know, you know, what kind of the history of these these creatures and stuff are. So I'm I'm really looking forward to to finding out more about uh, this crazy cast of of aliens. <laughs> yeah, same here. Although I would I wouldn't mind if a, a hammerhead alien made, made an appearance with a gonk droid or something like that. Oh yeah. <laughs> Of those regulars. Well, actually, the the gonk droid is confirmed to be in the movie because um, not in this photo of Oscar Isaac, but in the ones that were released um, when they released the trailer. If you look behind him, there's a gonk droid in the background. Oh, I didn't notice that. It doesn't surprise yeah. me though, because he's been in every movie so far, hasn't he? Um, except probably Empire. Empire is a pretty. There there aren't a lot of aliens or droids in Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. So, anyway, it's glad it's glad, it's glad to hear that he makes an appearance again. Yeah. Um, also, we have uh, some of the news is that a, a, um, a Josh Trank, who was set to re to direct one of the uh, Star Wars anthology films, he is leaving it actually um, to pursue original content, his own projects. Is that is, it, is that right? Um, that's the official statement. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> What's going I, on behind the scenes? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of rumor there, and, and some of it, I you know. The basic gist, I think, without getting into too much rumor, is that you know it, it's possible that um, we've kind of talked about this before of how you know it seems like the trend nowadays is if you make like one successful indie film, you get immediately pulled up into the blockbuster status. And so like that happened to Mark Webb from Five Hundred Days of Summer to the Amazing Spider-Man. It's happened with Colin Trevorrow from uh, Safety Not Guaranteed in Jurassic World, and Josh Trank went from Chronicle to Fantastic Four, and then was supposed to go on to the Star Wars movie. And, you know, a lot of people were always wondering, I mean, one, are we missing out on, you know, years worth of, of great smaller movies from these guys? And kind of the, the second thing was, is are these guys going to be able to handle it? And, I, you know, I think without getting into specifics and, and possible 
character defamation, you know, of him. Uh, the general consensus seems to be that maybe he couldn't handle it necessarily, or that it was just like he had the talent, but you know, just yeah, like just couldn't deal with it right away. Like like so like a like a high school basketball player who all of a sudden gets like pulled into the NBA or something like that. You know, like it's a lot. It's a lot of different stuff to deal with, even if the the basics are are all the same. So, you know, I, I you know I hope he I hope he recovers and and keeps producing good movies because you know it's kind of you know dropping out of a Star Wars movie is you know <laughs> isn't a, a good thing to be remembered for. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I was thinking about it too. Um, 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 I mean, like you and I, we we have a background in, in in film. We went to film school. We shot short short films and that kind of stuff. So I can just imagine, you know, if 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 we got together, we made a uh, an independent film that became a big hit all of a sudden. Imagine being suddenly asked to do Star Wars. It's just kind of like I don't, I don't know. I I mean I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be a little I'd be a little hesitant myself at this point. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where you're like, well, I would be crazy to say no, but at the same time, it's like I would also be probably crazy to say yes too, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was you know, this whole situation is kind of disappointing because I was actually at uh, at Star Wars Celebration. They had a panel that was supposed to be focused on the anthology movies and it was supposed to be a conversation with uh, Gareth Edwards um, who directed Godzilla and is doing Rogue One and then with Josh Trank and then conveniently and it was the whole thing is there had been a lot of rumors about Josh Trank even before then and so we we're all eager to see him show up and what he would talk about and then uh, Pablo Hidalgo who's um, in charge of the the story department at Lucasfilm comes out right before the panel starts and is like hey Josh Trank had a flu and at the time, a lot of people were like, oh, that's really convenient. And I was like, oh, let's give it the benefit of the doubt. But now it makes me question <laughs> whether he was actually sick that day or if they were like, yeah, we don't know if this is going to work out. So might as well just like cover our asses and just not show up right now so we can save ourselves as much embarrassment Yeah, when you leave the project. So Yeah. Well, in any case, we, we wish Josh Trank the best of luck on uh, whatever he does in the future. Um, and then finally, I will, I will say just to kind of defend him is, uh, and I think I may have mentioned this on last week's show is that the latest Fantastic Four trailer I think is way better than the stuff they've released so far. I'm still not like super excited for the movie, but I, it doesn't look like the disaster that some people are reporting or are hoping for. I don't really know. It's really, it's really tough to to figure out where where people's opinions are coming from on that one. Yeah, yeah, I really have no idea just because I, I am hearing a lot of backlash against against the movie so far um i think part of that is due to kind of the kind of kind of the the way the trailer has looked i've i've, I've, I've heard people complaining about the fact that they technically changed the definition of mr fantastic's powers which i think is stupid that if he's doing the same thing why complain about it <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um so i don't know i don't know it seems to be a popular movie to hate right now but hopefully it'll it'll turn things around if it turns out to be an actual good movie and people will start seeing it for what it is. So here, here, here's hoping he can pull it off. Um, and then finally we have uh, uh, Suicide Squad. We talked about in our last episode how they revealed the Joker, played by Jared Leto. And then uh, this past week, David Ayer, the director, has uh, re revealed a whole cast photo of a bunch of the uh, the cast members in full getup uh, from Suicide Squad. Um, I was mostly interested in Will Smith in this one just because, I, I don't know, the idea of Will Smith being in this movie is is fun. It 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 gives me hope that that, that this movie is going to have a, a more of a sense of humor than uh, a lot of the DC films have that had to to date. Um, I gotta say, I'm really rocking this photo. I like it. Yeah, it's it's really weird, <laughs> and I like that because it like it doesn't look like it necessarily is in the same world as as Batman versus Superman. Yeah, I love how we live in a world where. Uh, where characters, where where, where 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 you can make it, you can make an animated TV show based on a comic strip. You can create characters for the TV show, and then years later, when they make a film adaptation, they take some of those characters that were created in the in the TV show and put it in your comic book movie. As the case with the Harley Quinn. Him. Harley Quinn, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and we're also having that in um, in um, the uh, uh, the new X Men movie with. Um, uh, oh, what's 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 her what's her name? Jubilee. Yes, yes. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. It's 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 interesting. I I'm really excited to see how they pull off. Um, uh, man, I am just blanking on names today. What's her name in this movie? Suicide oh, Squad. Margot Robbie. Yes, yes. I'm really excited to see how how they 
how they pull her off because 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 she's I don't know Harley Quinn's been a really interesting character as far as the uh, uh, the Batman kind of mythos goes um, and in relationship to the Joker. So I'm really curious about how they're going to pull that off in, in this one, how they're going to portray their, their their relationship. Yeah. Have you seen uh, the Will Smith full body um, costume? Um, I haven't yet. I saw, I saw this photo, actually. Wait, hang on a sec. Let me send it to you, because there's one with him in the mask that Will Smith put out last night on his uh, Facebook page. Oh, I haven't seen that one yet. Let me, hang on a sec. I'm just so happy that Will Smith is in this movie. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a change for pace of, pay, of pace for him. Especially because, like, you know, he was supposed to be in like Django Unchained and, you know, like all these other cool movies and then wasn't, you know, so to see him actually in something like this, uh, I just sent you the link. Um, okay. But yeah, you know, it's it's, it's cool, especially because it's an ensemble movie. I think we've gotten so used to, to Will Smith being kind of a solo thing or like maybe like sharing it with a co-star. Um, yeah. So to see him part of the ensemble and possibly not even necessarily one of the, the main, main guys is is kind of refreshing. Yeah. Man, I gotta admit, um, looking at this picture, I'm, 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 I'm surprised they let Will Smith cover up his face like that. <laughs> yeah, and you wonder for how much of the movie they'll do that for. They'll have the mask on for like the opening action scene, and it gets blown off, and he's like, oh, I don't need the mask anymore. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, man, that looks pretty cool. I like that. I'm excited for this movie. You know what? I, I think I'm more excited for Suicide Squad than for any of the other DC movies coming out in the near future. I almost agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think this one's more up my alley. Than, than the other stuff, so I, I, I can I can forgive anyone for for looking forward to, it, to the other stuff, but this one's more my my kind of crazy, so yeah. I'm excited. So anyway, that about wraps it up as far as uh, film news uh, for this past week. Um, you want to move on to Avengers? Let's do it. Let's move on to Avengers. So, Nick, what did you think of Avengers: Age of Adeline? <laughs> A very common uh, misconception right there. Um, <laughs> I, I'll, give you, I'll give you my thoughts uh, briefly. Um, I don't think it reaches the same heights as the first one, but I don't think it has any of the lows that the first Avengers had. I know a lot of people love the first Avengers, and I really like it too, but I think there are a lot of elements in it that kind of put me off to it. Like, it has a really terrible first act, um, and it kind of... It, especially compared to the other Marvel movies has a like the light I it's like overlit or something like that so it kind of looks flat for a lot of the movie and there's just kind of a lot of elements to it that you know the movie kind of just feels like a big blur to me whenever I think about it whereas this one I feel is much more distinct um I also think it's much more consistent and I think there's there's a better balance between uh big action set pieces and then the you know character driven moments um it, you know, it, it takes a while to get started and, you know, and it, and it takes a lot of um, extended moments to kind of like, you know, get us involved with the characters, like the like the scenes at Hawkeye's farm, for example. And yeah, I think those are the best moments in the movie. Um, if I had one complaint, it's that I think the movie is um, too short, <laughs> as weird as that's going to be. <laughs> it's, I, I think there's kind of a, a weird like pendulum when it comes to, to film lengths and that you either have to cut a movie down so much that it's like okay this works as you know a movie or you have to extend it out so it feels complete and i feel like this movie even though it's at like two and a half hours it feels like two films in one in an occasionally good way for the most part there are just a couple of moments that i feel like uh if we were equating this to a comic book would have gotten their own like issue like thor's side quest in the movie which feels really truncated um so if, if if there were another half hour of this movie, I probably wouldn't complain, and I think it would allow things to to be fleshed out a little better. Yeah, at at, at this point, um, well, first off, I I pretty much enjoy all the Marvel movies. I don't think there's a single one out there that I didn't like. Um, there are some that I like more than others, but for me at this point, most of them kind of boiled down to the same feelings for me as in like I watched it I'm like oh yeah that was exactly what I expected now let's just move on to the next one um I think I think I've lost a lot of that the the uh the hype for these movies just because I know what to expect and I'm not surprised almost every time there are a couple exceptions but for the most part I get exactly what I paid for for these movies which is fine I like them a lot um and that was the way I kind of felt about this one I went into it expecting it to be 
a lot of fun, some great banter. You know, Joss Whedon did, did that really well in the first movie. Um, I love watching the character interactions uh, between each other because much as much as they're they're fine to watch in their own movies, I really think they shine the most when you put them all together in a room and just see how they react to each other, which you see a lot of in this movie. Yeah, uh, which is great. Um, I think I think my I think my biggest complaint about the movie is is I I got to a point where I was watching the movie and it would slow down for you know, some scenes of, of exposition and they're saying, all right, here's how we're going to get to the next big action scene. And I, I was kind of at the point where I was like, all right, let's just get to the next big action scene. Whereas a movie like um, uh, Captain America, the Winter Soldier, I was really invested in the actual plot to that movie. And I was really invested in, you know, the quiet times in between the action set pieces. Whereas I felt like where Age of Ultron shines the most is in its action scenes because they still deal with that banter between the characters and there's still character growth Happen, well, not really character even growth, but just kind of kind of uh, character arcs happening within the action scenes. Yeah. Uh, whereas I feel like when the movie slows down, it's just getting ready to set up for the next scene. Like, all right, we're going to move to this new location, guys. Uh, here's a MacGuffin in this area that we need to get to. So let's just move there as fast as we can. <laughs> yeah, in, in kind of in that way, it's the most comic booky movie ever made. And I know we say that pretty much for every every Marvel movie, but this one literally feels like, okay, guys, this was the this was the Age of Ultron series of comics that we had, and we put it into uh, a paperback collection, and we just made the film adaptation of that. Because, like, I, you know, I've had a lot of, you know, comics where like you just own an issue or you own the entire arc, and even if you own the, the entire arc, you can kind of tell where each issue ended. Not even because it explicitly says, "Oh, the end," but just you can kind of feel there's this natural like, "Oh, there's like a mini arc in in this area." So. Uh, yeah, I kind of get it that the, the movie kind of feels like, you know, even even though there is a progression from one scene to another, it does feel slightly kind of choppy. And then again, it kind of goes back to me wondering if that, you know, if an extra 30 minutes or whatever would have smoothed that out. Yeah, exactly. And 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 um, 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 I did enjoy, actually, there were a couple a couple little bait and switches that they had in this movie. Um, which, which again, Joss Whedon did that in the first one. For instance, with the uh, the puny gods scene in the first Avengers movie, mm-hmm. they have a couple sequences like that in this one, where where you know a character comes up, or like or like like Scarlet Witch, Scarlet Witch would come up behind someone, you know, and uh, play with their minds, and then she's doing that to like everybody, and then she comes up to Hawkeye, and he's like, nope, and he just like kind of like turns on her. <laughs> oh, I love that point. Yeah, <laughs> Hawkeye in general is like the best part of this movie. Oh man, I'm so happy for Hawkeye in this movie. It's like it's, it, I I felt like I felt like. Hawkeye got his own movie or, or his own moments in this movie, as in um, same way Chekhov got his own moments in uh, Star Trek IV: The Voyage Home. Oh yeah, yeah. Whereas like he has his own little, he he finally has his own little 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 plot line that happens that focuses on him. I'm like, good for you, Hawkeye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I just think you know, good on Joss Whedon for you know after basically turning him into one of Loki's zombie lackeys in the in the last one, you know, gives him all the the best lines and moments in this movie. He does have some of the best lines in this movie. He's great. Yeah, um, and that and that's kind of a thing that I, I like uh, to Josh Whedon's approach in this one is he realizes okay in the past three years since the last Avengers movie we've had an Iron Man movie we've had a Captain America movie we've had a Thor movie obviously we we still need to focus on those characters but I'm going to take this more as an opportunity to to you know shine the spotlight on Hulk or Black Widow or Hawkeye or all these characters who haven't gotten a solo movie or we haven't really seen as much of in the past three years yeah i do love how how um um the film for me also it, it, it kind of works as a, as a as a commentary on um superhero films in general today i found um for instance for instance that, that, that uh, man of steel came out one of the biggest complaints people had about the movie is that superman and uh zod had this massive fight between two omnipotent characters and they destroy a city and no one seems to care uh, in this one, you have a similar fight between two super-powered beings that are practically invincible. Uh, as as trailers have shown, Iron Man and Hulk have a fight in the movie, um, but they can't, but but they take a couple moments during the fight where, 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 for instance, Iron Man tries to take the fight out of the city, and he like tries to fly Hulk away from the city. It doesn't quite work, but he tries, and yeah. he's like trying to save people during the fight. I'm like, someone someone watch Man of Steel and listen to the to the uh, the audience's reaction. <laughs> well, funny is like if um, if Man of Steel was like, destruction porn 
then this was like saving civilians porn because they spend a lot of time being like, we have to get everyone out of the city and just like showing, showing like, it, it almost feels like every single person getting saved, you know? Yeah. Like, like, like there was a moment, there, there was one moment where the way it was presented in the trailer made me think it was going to be a, a darker moment, which is that uh, Captain America is running to the end of a bridge. A car is about to fall off. He grabs the uh, spoiler in the back but it breaks off and the car goes pulling into its, its fall. And in the trailer, I was like, oh, this is a movie that's going to deal with, like, oh, we can't save everyone. But then, of course, in the movie, I think, like, Thor comes along and, and grabs the car or grabs the people out of the car or something like that. And it, it was one of those moments where it was like, oh, like, you know, I think you could have let, like, those people die just to show that, like, hey, even though they're still trying, they can't save everyone. Um, yeah, yeah. I just felt, I just felt, felt the same way. Um, I remember seeing, seeing that moment in the movie, and I was like, oh, shit, they're actually going to, like, die like like civilians are going to die and they're going to highlight the fact that some civilians died in this and then they did but I was, but but um, um in a way i was kind of thinking like you know what I, I don't want these marvel films going dark but i feel like this this movie could have could use a moment like that to kind of highlight yeah, like you know, there are consequences to these scenes yeah you don't you don't want the, the whole movie to be like that but if you have a moment like that i think it goes a long way to like just you know punctuating that idea exactly exactly um which i really felt felt like felt like could could, could, could help it out a lot um, it is funny that, that, um, they, they highlight so much the, the, the hero saving normal civilians in these giant fight scenes, because I feel like in Man of Steel, they actually didn't quite have as much destruction as they showed in this movie, surprisingly. I feel like more buildings came down and more shit got destroyed than was in Man of Steel, and you see more people in this movie than you did in Man of Steel. <laughs> I think... I, I think the difference is well, all the destruction in in Man of Steel was was one city, so it was more destruction for one area. Whereas in this movie, you know, they go to you know South Korea, they go to Africa, they go to you know uh, wherever that fictional country that the twins are from. You know, they go to different places. So even if technically the destruction is more in Man of Steel, it's all one area, and it's very evocative of like. 9-11 and it's very like just like yeah. dark and depressing and like all these buildings are falling in whereas in you know in this movie yeah buildings fall down but if they do they're either evacuated like in that uh, the fictional country at the end or um you know when they, when they smash into a building the whole thing doesn't come down you know so i so it might technically be more destruction but it, it doesn't um it's it's not destruction you feel bad about watching. I'll, I'll put it that way. Yeah, exactly. Because the characters have their hearts in the right place. They're trying to save these people, and um, um, it's just a more lighthearted movie in general. So, um, I loved Ultron in this movie, by the way. <laughs> James Ultron, Spader was perfect. It's he he's way more spadery. Than I was expecting with all his his kind of quips and faults and and whatever and it, it took me a while to kind of get used to that um, and I think it's because the trailers don't really portray him in that way and I think you know a lot of people are kind of complaining about that they're like oh my gosh like Ultron you know he you know we thought he was going to be this you know big evil god robot thing and I, I'm looking at that and I'm like well I mean you know you can't really bring that necessarily into the you know the movie you can't really let that affect your opinion because i still think ultron is a pretty <laughs> is a pretty great character especially when when you realize that the reason for all of his one-liners and stuff is because he's he's kind of inherited uh part of tony stark's personality you know um through his programming so of course he's going to be like the bad son or something like that yeah exactly and, and, and he's 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 really funny in this movie like 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 ultron's got the jokes and i loved it <laughs> yeah he um um, um, they take moments in this movie also to, 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 to use kind of Ultron's sense of humor. Uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, they, 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 they point out um, flaws in superhero movies and just kind of make, make a commentary on superhero movies in general. And at one point he even says like, oh, I'm going to take this moment to, to describe my evil plan. And he just all out attacks them. I love, I love moments like that. Yeah. It, it, it gives him more character, um, which, I, I, which I wasn't I love... expecting. I love the moment when he's trying to escape and the Hulk jumps onto his plane and you just hear Ultron go, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, I think, was the most James spader moment in the whole movie. Yeah, and, and it, it, fit, it fit in with the, with, with the, 
the uh, the tone of the movie and everything. Um, I don't think it de-intimidated him at all. Um, I still felt like he's one of the stronger villains we've had in a while. Um, that's, that's one complaint I've had about some of the, the Marvel villains in recent history is that um, they've gotten to a point where some of them I just kind of forget about. You know, like, like oh, here's this stock villain in this one. Um, I love Guardians of the Galaxy. I felt like it had that problem. Uh, Thor, the Dark World, I think, had that problem. Whereas this one... They made him unique enough that I, that I that I was like, oh yeah, I remember Ultron, that guy, you know, the robot with a sense of humor that's still super evil and wants to exterminate mankind, <laughs> um, yeah, which I really I appreciated. Yeah. So. Yeah, I loved it. I thought he was great. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I'm gonna go down. Unless there's anything else you want to bring up, I'm gonna go down a quick list of of non-spoilery things to talk about before we get into spoilers. Sounds good. Uh, I love there's, there's a recurring gag. Where, so the, the first two uh, <laughs> the first two lines in the whole movie I think are pretty great. The first line is Tony Stark either gets shot at or he hits something and goes shit, and then immediately Captain America responds with language. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and it starts this great running gag that, that has a payoff that I, I won't spoil here, and I, I won't even spoil it in the spoiler section. Um, but it's just, it, it, it's, a, it's a really funny... Uh, recurring gag that I think, you know, speaks a lot to Cap's character and, you know, uh, and again, just shows off the camaraderie and the bouncing off of, of characters in the movie. Yeah. Well, that's another, that's another interesting, interesting, interesting thing about uh, Captain America specifically um, is, is not only does, does that language issue become a, a, a recurring gag, but um, um, it really plays into kind of their relationship between each other, Iron Man and Captain America's relationship in general. Um, where there's a scene where they're, they're, they're chopping wood and I, and T Tony Stark basically says, I forget what the conversation said, but it was, it was, along, the, it was along the lines of, he was, he, was saying, he was saying that he didn't care about some aspects of uh, Captain America's personality because he was like too, too good or whatever, you know, you know, he doesn't have any flaws. He basically says, I don't, I don't trust a guy without a dark side. So that was interesting because that's another complaint that I've heard a lot of people say about Captain America is that he's too Boy Scout-ish and he, he, he's, he's, too good guy esque, you know, and he doesn't have any flaws or anything like that. Which for me is, has been one of the refreshing things about him is that it's, it's that I, I'm fine with having a character like that, a character that just works purely as a role model. Yeah, because uh, you know, I, a lot of people complain about you know the Captain America character and especially the first the Captain America movie because of that because he doesn't change. But I always think the point of the Captain America movies isn't it, it isn't about him changing as it is either other people changing around him. Or about Captain America being thrown in a situation that challenges his beliefs and how he has to deal with that, like the Winter Soldier does. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and going off that whole thing, that you know, the reason I love the, the Tony Stark Cap um, butting heads is because I, I think it was a good way to set up Civil War without being like, oh, hey, there's going to be a movie where this is going to be <laughs> a much bigger deal, you know? I was thinking um, the exact same thing. Yeah, so so I I, th I think it was a good way, you know. If if you know Civil War is coming, awesome. If you don't, it doesn't matter. It's just a great moment in this movie, you know. Exactly. Um, uh, we probably want to talk about the twins, uh, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, um, who are making their first appearance here. Although Quicksilver technically <laughs> appeared in X Men: Days of Future Past, although that was <laughs> in, uh, a different take on the character and and whatnot. Um, Scarlet Witch, I think, was really great. Um, I know some people are complaining about her, her powers in the movie and how they don't really understand them. And from my understanding, uh, I don't think they're very consistent in the comics either. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, there was one thing, and, and we kind of talked about this um, briefly outside the podcast, which is that there's a moment very early in the movie that I'm going to call a negative, but only because they did something really cool for one moment and didn't carry it through the rest of the movie, which is that... Um, in the very beginning, Captain America uh, bumps into Baron, is it Von Strucker? I think is his name. Strucker, yeah. Yeah. And they kind of have this this uh, discussion, and Scarlet Witch comes up behind Cap and does something to him. And then she kind of like walks backwards, but the editing on it is like it comes out of like a Japanese horror movie. And I was like, ooh, that's really creepy, and that adds like another level to her character. And yet, that technique is never used again. And I was like, "Damn it! I really wanted to see that happen again." I was really hoping that they 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 play her off as a a a kind of a terrifying 
uh, quote unquote witch character, you know, you know that 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 can get inside your head, um, and you, you know, you know, and is able to appear and disappear in a really kind of terrifying way. Um, I was thinking, I was thinking that 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 if people were complaining about Ultron, they could at least go to Scarlet Witch as kind of this, you know, this dark center of the of the villainy in the in the in the movie, um, and that's and from that scene, I was like, oh man, we're gonna get a whole lot more of this, but no, no, they kind of. That's all they really do with it, which is, which is a little bit disappointing. I was really looking forward to have a, a more terrifying character <laughs> yeah. in, this, in this movie. Um, and so what, what did you think of um, Quicksilver, especially compared to – it's funny. I had a conversation with someone the other day where I was like, a lot of people are, are trying to compare the two Quicksilvers. And yeah, sure, each of them appears in, in one movie each at this point. Um, but I almost think it's kind of an unfair comparison because they're they're told they're two totally radical, radically different takes on the character. And Quicksilver in, in Days of Future Past, like a lot of people are like, oh, he's the better version. And it's like, well, that's only because he has that great time in a bottle sequence, you know, which this Quicksilver yeah. doesn't really have anything like. And I'll admit, like, I, I actually started to really like this take on Quicksilver uh, in the final act of the movie. So I was, I'm just curious where you kind of fall on that. Um, yeah, yeah. So going in, obviously, I, I, you can't go into this movie if you've seen Days of Future Past. You can't go into Age of Ultron without comparing the two in some way. And I went into it knowing that they're going to be two completely different characters. I'm not even going to start thinking about them like that. What I was more curious about is how they're going to approach his power specifically, um, because they both have the same power. The one in Days of Future Past and the one in this one have, have, have you know, you know, they're both, both they're both super fast. I was really curious about how they're going to, to deal with that in this one and if, if they're going to change anything based on what they saw in Days of Future Past. Um, and they didn't really. They didn't, it doesn't seem like they tried, which is, which is, which is, which is probably the safer, the safer route to go is, is if you can't one-up something that's been done so well to begin with, just don't even try to go there and just deal with the character the best way that you know how. Yeah. Um, which they did. And, and does this Quicksilver have any power related moments that are nearly as good as that one scene in Days of Future Past? No, he doesn't. But he works fine for this movie. This movie came out and Days of Future Past had to come out. I wouldn't even be thinking about it, is the thing. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Although I, I really like that, that moment where he saves all the people in front of the, uh, the train that's out yeah. of control. That was a cool moment. Yeah, I think, my favorite, I think my favorite moment of his was when he tried to grab a Thor's hammer as it's flying through the air. Oh, he kind of slows point. down. Actually, he had a couple great moments because there's that one part where he, he runs into the city to warn everyone, and he's like, "Hey, everyone, we got to get out of here." And then he leaves, and no one does anything. So then he comes back in like two seconds later with a machine gun and shoots up the roof and then leaves. <laughs> yeah, and he has and he has plenty of great little moments like that. Um, um, it's just it's it's almost a shame that Days of Future Past came out because because then you think about like, oh man, but they but they did that one scene, Days of Future Past, and just it's it's just it's haunting the back of my head when he's a, a great character in and of himself. Totally different guy. He's, he's he's has a different backstory, um, and different motives in this one, and a totally different story in general. Uh, which is which is fine. He worked great for this movie, um, but he is part of a larger ensemble cast also, and he and so he tends to get buried among everyone else. Which which actually 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 you know what? I'm not sure what you thought about this, but were there too many superheroes in this movie? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> no. I don't think so because, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's it's weird that people will have that complaint because it's 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 basically saying oh there's too many characters. Then it's like well look at an Ocean's Eleven or a Dirty Dozen or whatever. Like the only real difference is oh these characters just have superpowers and you you know them from other things. So I think it's easy for people to say because oh because all these things don't naturally you know fit together. I mean, they do because in the comics, they're always together and whatnot, but you know, in, in that kind of a sense, they don't naturally, you know, fit together or whatever that there would be too much of it, but I don't, I don't think that's a problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I'm, I'm, um, there is quite a bit going on. Some characters get buried when they're not on screen, but when they are on screen, I feel like they get plenty of, plenty of great moments. So you don't forget them. I mean, like, uh, Bruce Banner has plenty of moments. He actually has a pretty important part in this, in, in this movie. Uh, where when he's not on screen, you're not thinking consciously about him, but when he's on screen, he, he matters a whole lot. Black yeah. Widow has scenes like that. Uh, 
Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch have seemed like that. Basically, like, everyone gets their own moments to shine, their own little plot points. We already talk, we've already talked about how Hawkeye is really kind of an important part of this movie as well. And I think they do that really well without without burying everyone too much, which yes. was, to his credit, uh, Sam Raimi people said weren't, weren't able to do that in Spider-Man 3. I feel like Joss Whedon dealt with twice as many characters uh, in, a, in a better way in this one. Well, um, and I, I was thinking about that because people will always say, oh, Spider-Man 3 had too many characters. And then you look at something like this that, you know, to me anyway, it works. And I think the big difference there is Spider-Man 3 doesn't work because it's too many characters are villains. And it's, it's not villains who are necessarily always working together. Like, it's different when you have main villain, henchmen, you know, maybe a side villain that they have to get in, involved in whatever. Because if you ask me who is the main villain in Spider-Man 3, I would be like, oh, Venom, because he's in all the posters. And it's like, well, but Venom doesn't really appear until the very end of the movie. You know, it's like, okay, well, Sandman. It's like, well, Sandman kind of turns out to be, like, a good guy, I guess, in the end. It's like, oh, whatever. <laughs> it's like, oh, how about Harry? Well, Harry, you know, like, whatever. Whereas opposed to this movie, it's like, no, Ultron is the villain. And it's yeah. very clear. It's, it's all these characters working towards, you know, one villain, one conflict. Um, yeah. And I just, so I think the too many villains case in, like, a Spider-Man 3 or something like that doesn't work because it throws the structure off. And who, who we're fighting, why we're fighting, and how things progress. Whereas Ultron is just like, this is one guy. Yeah, he's got, like, a million different, you know, uh, underlings and whatever. But it's like, we're all going for the same goal here. Yeah. Well, kudos to Joss Whedon for being being able to balance all those all all those, all those heroes together as well. Um, yeah. I'm really pulling I'm really pulling the, pulling the the idea that they have to work together as one of the strong points of giving each character their own their own little little story. Yeah, and we haven't we haven't even talked about Vision, but I think we want to save him for spoilers. Probably. Yeah, I think we have to. <laughs> but I think we can say Vision's Vision's pretty awesome, even if I'm still kind of confused by him. Yeah. Well. Well, on that note, do you want to move on to spoilers? Or is there anything else you want us to talk about before? Uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna hit up a couple real quick points. Um, I really dug Andy Serkis's cameo as Claw. Um, I thought it was actually a great way to set up his possible role in the Black Panther movie without feeling like it was setting up for it. Because in this movie, it's just like, oh, we have to go to this country where there's this guy who's dealing this, you know, vibranium stuff, and then oh, you know, Ultron gets mad at him and cuts off his arm. And it's like if you don't know that in Black Panther, he becomes that character becomes the claw who's one of the primary villains and has like a mechanical claw arm and whatever. And, you know, is all these different things. Like it, it would, it doesn't affect the movie at all, you know? And I, I think it was a really good way of kind of doing like a backdoor origin to that villain so that if he is the main villain in a black Panther movie, he can just hit the ground running. Yeah. I love how the, 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 the um, 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 beforehand everyone was speculating like, Oh, who's that? He's going to play. He's, is he going to play a character that something happens to him and then he has to become, you know, a, a a completely CGI character because he's Eddie Circus. No, he's he's just Eddie Circus acting in a movie. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Uh, uh, one last thing I think we can talk with uh, touch on that isn't spoilery is the uh, Hulk Black Widow romance, which to me initially seemed really random until I thought about it and was like, oh, these are actually the two people on the team who don't really trust themselves and are slowly opening themselves up to each other. And so, and, and kind of when I realized that, I was like, oh, that's actually kind of a perfect, a perfect matchup. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of humor when like, you know, Captain America basically blesses their romance. And, um, and then there's, there's a kind of a really devastating scene uh, at Hawkeye's farm when they're, they're talking to each other. Uh, and I, I actually thought of all the character work, that was probably some of the best in the movie. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is that, am, am I misremembering the first Avengers movie or did, did, did Black Widow and Hawkeye have a thing going before? They're just really good friends. Okay, okay, they are. That's that's what I was wondering. It's, it's been a while since I've seen the first Avengers movie, uh, but I remember thinking afterwards, I'm like, wait, didn't they have like a thing going on? And, it, and it was, in which case, thinking back on it, I'm like, was Hawkeye cheating on his wife? But no, okay, okay, that's that's good. No. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, I think we can get into spoilers now. All right. So from here on out, we're talking about spoilers for uh, Avengers: Age of Ultron. Um. So Vision. <laughs> I'm trying to leave that. I thought you were going to start off straight up being like Quicksilver dies. <laughs> Quicksilver dies. <laughs> I. But who's really surprised that Quicksilver dies? I mean, I, apparently a lot of people were though because I guess the way the whole Hawkeye thing gets set up, uh, people just assume that he would be killed off. Which I'll get into that later. I got a, an article I'm considering writing about 
kind of the the problem with fans assuming Hawkeye was a killable character. Um, but <laughs> but I'll, I'll get into that in the article. Um, but Quicksilver's death kind of bummed me out, which I mean, guess I guess that kind of means it worked on some level, only because he was just becoming an interesting character at that time. Yeah. Well, kudos, kudos to them for 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 killing off Quicksilver while at the same time keeping Scarlet Witch alive. Because once Quicksilver died, I thought, oh no, Scarlet Witch is going to die, and we're going to have these these two new characters who are going to die off, so we can so we can kill off someone in a movie. Um, but they didn't. They kept quick. They kept Scarlet Witch alive, which which. So happily surprised me because I didn't expect that of them. And I, I, I expect that um, uh, Quicksilver's death will have a very big impact on Scarlet Witch going forward. I mean, Maybe. we already, got, I mean, she already kind of has a major freak out in the movie when that happens. So I wouldn't be surprised if if she's still dealing with that in the next couple of movies. Maybe he'll show up in Agents of Shield. <laughs> oh, gosh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, the, 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 um, um, I was wondering how the ending of this movie is going to affect the Avengers kind of films going forward uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that they introduced several new characters who are heroes that, 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 that at the end they kind of say, oh, you guys are all Avengers now. And so I'm wondering, like, oh, so going forward, are we going to be losing some of the, some of the old characters? Because I know that some of these actors' contracts are, are running out pretty well, soon. So, so at the end of the movie, we have a new Avengers team, which consists of Captain America, Black Widow, um, War Machine, Falcon, Vision, and Scarlet Witch, which is actually really cool because when I thought about it, I was like, this is, a, this is an Avengers team that consists of two black men, two women, an alien android god thing, and then Captain America is the only white male Avenger going forward. And I was like, oh, that's kind of a cool, diverse lineup that we have. Um, yeah, I think um, the contract thing is interesting because obviously – you know, um, you know, Iron Man's going to appear in Civil War. Captain America will appear in Captain uh, Civil War. Obviously, Thor has Ragnarok, but I think then they have one. There's the two-part Avenger movie, and I think some of those guys are only going to come back for one of them or something like that. And so I think, and I think this is a smart thing: is they're basically setting up, hey, the Avengers is it's a rotating roster. You know, if people want to leave and not be a part of it, they don't have to be. We have we have different people coming in, and I'm assuming with the new movies with you know, Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, Black Panther, that will get even more people on the team uh, by the by the next time. Um, and actually, uh, according to the original script, the uh, ending was supposed to include other people too, like Captain Marvel was originally going to appear, but then they, you know, they didn't cast her in time and decide like, oh, I don't think we just want to show her fully formed. I think we'd rather, you know, introduce her properly in her own movie. Um, so originally it was going to be an even more, uh, diverse lineup that we have, but I, but I think for for right now, I think it was a pretty good um, way to move forward, especially because like I'm you know it finally incorporates a War Machine into the the Avengers, and I feel like ever since like you know uh, Rhodey got the armor, it was always like why don't you just put him on the team? That way you have two Iron Men, you know? Yeah, exactly. Speaking of Iron Man and a rotating ro- a rotating ro- roster, by the way. Did I miss something, or, or or did he retire from being Iron Man at the end of Iron Man three, and just kind of showed up again Iron Manning in this one without any explanation? Okay, I I don't know. Um, <laughs> is, that's what I thought too, and I thought um, I thought how the movie would originally start was um, remember in Iron Man three how he can control suits remotely. Yeah, I thought that is how like the beginning would start, and then Ultron would take over those suits, and Iron Man would be like, oh, I have to go, you know, manually with the suit. Now. Yeah, I thought that would like force it back into the game, but that's not how it's presented in the movie. But then I read a lot of people's uh, takes on the end of Iron Man three, and I guess it's not a general consensus that he actually retires at the end, and that it's more of just like him coming to peace that he is Iron Man, and that he just like, you know, because before he was like, oh, I'm Iron Man because I have this thing inside me, the reactor thing, and then at the end of the movie he throws that away, and that wasn't, I guess that wasn't him getting rid of it so much as like this doesn't define me as iron man i just am iron man you know okay okay that makes more sense because i remember when this one started out it opens up with an action scene of uh with with iron man with the avengers and i was thinking like oh okay so after this scene are they going to have like a a, a one line thing thrown off just to say like oh by the way you guys recruited me back by some something or other but they never had a moment like that so i so i was wondering if i need to go back and rewatch iron man 3 to see if i missed something <laughs> yeah uh, yeah i'm i'll have to go back and, and double check but yeah 
Yeah. Um, I vision to me in this movie is fascinating. Uh, just just from a character standpoint, because we haven't had a character like this, I think, in a Marvel movie so far. Yeah. Um, he, he, he's 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 one that um um I think he raises more questions of kind of morality and ethics and all that kind of stuff um, that I think Marvel's even touched in to date because because who he is what he is what he stands for isn't really clear but you get some ideas from it um, especially considering the fact that he uh, to date he is the only other person who can lift up Thor's hammer which that was probably my favorite moment in the whole movie because it was and I, 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 the character's greatest moment and it's such a simple thing and I remember when that happened in, in the audience because they kind of set that up with having a whole scene at the party where everyone's trying to lift Thor's hammer and the only person who even comes close just by budging is Captain America um, which I think is setting up something that'll pay off further down the road but having Vision pick up the hammer like everyone in the audience just gasped I mean it's such a great moment but it's such a, a, a quick clear clean way of saying like yeah you could trust this guy yeah exactly um which 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 not only can you trust him but he he might be more trustworthy or trust, more trustworthy than anybody else in that room <laughs> yeah um which 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 what fascinates me most about him is the fact that um he he comes in as kind of the he's almost like a god character in this in this movie because he comes in um uh basically they 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 upload Jarvis's mind, I guess, or whatever, into this, this kind of this, this perfect body that Ultron had originally created for himself, uh, which is, I guess, a body that is supposed to be invulnerable to, to anything and is more advanced than any, anything on the planet. Um, and then they upload Jarvis into that, and they, they, they combine it with um, one of the, uh, the Infinity Stones, the one, the Mind Stone or whatever, mm -hmm. which comes from outer space. So what you get is, is a is a being that is almost set, almost set, almost set up to be all powerful, but he has, I guess, a, a, a super clear sense of right and wrong. And all he wants to do is, is, is he's not on anybody's side, but he just wants to save lives or, 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 or help life moving forward in any way possible. Whereas Ultron had that same point of view, but he, but he, he had it from the point of view of, you know, in order for something to survive and, and, and evolve, they must be destroyed. So they have this opportunity to, to grow beyond that. Whereas, whereas Vision sees it as people need, people need, need to grow and move forward by us helping them live and let, let, let them figure it out for themselves. <laughs> yeah. In a way. It'll be, it'll be really interesting to see his character going forward. Yeah. 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 I'm really curious. So, so in the, in the comics, he has very clear connections. I noticed with, uh, with Ant-Man, Hank Pym, um, and so I was wondering if they're going to have a connection with him and Ant-Man in, in this movie, considering that we have an Ant-Man movie coming up pretty soon, uh, yeah, he does. which he doesn't in this movie. Um, but it makes me wonder if, the, if Vision is going to become a character in Ant-Man. We just don't know it yet. <laughs> That'd be interesting. I, I doubt it though. Cause I feel like that movie is meant to be pretty small and self-contained. Yeah. Which would be fine. I'd be fine with it. I was just kind of curious. Like, Oh, that'd be interesting. If they brought Hank Pym into this, into this whole thing. Um, um I almost want to see, vision have his own movie just so we can delve more into this, this this character and like what what his thought process is because he he doesn't stand with the avengers at, at the end of the movie does he yeah he does does he at the, at the, well, well i mean i mean as, as, as part of the new avengers team at the very end what was he yep. was he there? okay yeah. i must have missed that then so i was really curious about whether whether or not he's gonna he's gonna go on with the avengers or whether he's or whether, whether he's gonna go on and kind of do his own thing out in the uh out in the world <laughs> Yeah, it's like I just got to plug in my laptop. No problem. Yeah. It's, so um, um, they also kind of set set up, set up Vision and Vision and Ultron to be kind of the uh, the the two opposite ends of of right and wrong, kind of almost a like yin yang sort of thing. Because uh, again, they they both have this the same goals in mind, but they go about it in totally different ways. Basically, Ultron wants to destroy everyone. Vision wants to save everyone. Um, yeah, and I really like their last conversation together before Vision annihilates Ultron. <laughs> Especially because he has that line where, you know, Vision goes on about his whole thing about how he feels about humans, and then he kind of stops and goes, "But what do I know? I was only born yesterday." <laughs> I was a little disappointed actually that they were so evenly, well, 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 they, they, they're portrayed to be kind of evenly paired. Where, 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 whereas I felt like Vision already has like this 
this super perfect, you know, uh, uh, supposedly perfect body or whatever, shouldn't he be able to just take down Ultron just like nothing? <laughs> Yeah, because there's that one moment where, where it's, it's Vision, Iron Man, and Thor all combining power to uh, <laughs> to take him down. Again, yeah, it's one of those things where like, oh, all these people have, you know, powers and whatever, and who's stronger than another one and and whatever. And, and maybe kind of like, that's the thing I liked about the first Avengers movies. You have that great fight between Iron Man, Thor, and Captain America in the woods, and it kind of establishes that, that oh, you know, um, Thor is stronger than Iron Man's armor but he's not entirely invincible and then thor's hammer isn't stronger than captain america's shield and, and whatever and i felt that was kind of lacking in this movie or i just didn't notice any clear moment where it was like oh this works for this but not for this or whatever yeah yeah i guess so it, it was interesting how they how they how, how they could combine powers in there and it's so, so, some of their fight scenes in this one but it wasn't really clear cut as to the 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 uh the limits of their powers either so yeah, that's my thoughts on Vision. <laughs> and I, I love that they, 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 they kept on Paul Bettany, who voices Jarvis. Because, you know, I, I remember it was kind of weird when the first Iron Man came out and it was like, oh, like, Jarvis is, is voiced by this pretty well-known actor. And so it's kind of great that he finally gets to actually show his face. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, <laughs> it's... It's kind 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 of kind of, um, um, kind of, kind of lucky lucky for for Vision that that Ultron built the same body of the guy who who voices Jarvis. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those things that for it's kind of the the best worst case because when you think of it, Paul Bettany probably had the easiest job of any actor in the Marvel universe before because he pretty much just like showed up in a sound booth, recorded his lines in one day, got a paycheck, and left. And now he probably has to be in a, in a makeup chair for hours and hours <laughs> to be able to stand alongside the other characters. How great would it have been if Ultron, if Ultron had built that same body just based on James Spader, but we still got Jarvis's voice coming out of it? That would have been amazing. <laughs> I, I just want James Spader walking around with Paul Bettany's voice. So, anyway, um, um, I think that's most of my notes on this. Do you have anything else? Um, not really. Although I, I, I will admit, uh, going back to the visions, uh, Thor's vision was the was my favorite Thor movie uh, moment now of any of the movies just because like <laughs> asgard in that clip like it made me super excited for ragnarok because asgard in that clip like actually looked creepy and weird and ancient and medieval and like everything i it, i feel like it should but hasn't been especially because like like thor the dark world I'm, I'm pretty sure is my least favorite of these movies because i felt like they kind of set themselves up for a certain type of movie and then just return to earth at the end and it's like well you know i you know i like thor's fish out of water thing but at the same time i kind of just want to see an awesome Asgard adventure, you know. Yeah, yeah. Which, 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 hopefully, which hopefully we'll get in Thor Ragnarok. Um, I gotta say, my 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 least favorite thing about this movie, I think, is probably the uh, the weird pool or well that that, that oh, yeah. Thor had to go into that they didn't I, explain very well. Yeah, it's like why why couldn't Scarlet Witch have accidentally revealed something? Or it, again, I think that's one of the moments that got hurt in editing. Where if they had made the movie longer, you know, we could have. We could have paid more attention to that, especially because like Stellan Skarsgård shows up and has like two lines. <laughs> yeah, and it's like I'm sure like that paycheck, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, um, I think just final thoughts. I enjoyed it. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to say as far as where it ranks in the other films in the series. Um, um, I don't know if I liked it as much as the first Avengers, but I mean, like for me, most of these movies rank around the same for me. They're they're they're, they're all pretty much enjoyable. They're all fun movies. I'm looking forward to the to, to Ant Man, um, and yeah, it's it's a good time at the movies, and it's a good time at uh, with with the Marvel film in this in this universe. Just make sure you've you've watched all the movies up up until this point. <laughs> I don't think you even necessarily. I mean, kind of for some points, but I actually think this movie does a pretty good job of being standalone in that yeah the circumstances are you know basically all you have to know is that like bad stuff has happened before so tony stark wants to create ultron because he knows other bad stuff is going to happen in the future like i you know i i feel like a lot of people when they talk about how these movies don't work as standalone things like like i, I mean sure it's a sequel so obviously there's a certain amount of knowledge you have to have going in just as you would if you were watching empire strikes back or you know, the Matrix sequels or the Pirates of the Caribbean sequels or, or whatever. But I, I feel like a lot of people unfairly are like, oh, the only way you can understand this stuff is if you know the comics or if you know that there's going to be this movie in the future and whatever. And I don't think that's really fair. I think that's just 
certain people know that and they kind of bring that baggage in with them because I think the movie does do a pretty good job of being like, hey, this is stuff that's going on, but for the most part, it's just internal to this film, you know? Like I said earlier with the stuff with um, um, Andy Serkis as, as Claw, you know, it doesn't feel like a backdoor origin to, you know, the Black Panther movie. Although yeah. I'll admit that the, the gems thing with Thor is, is probably the most explicit thing. It's like, yeah, you probably need to have some idea of whatever. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I think I think it certainly helps if you've seen the uh, previous films, uh, especially to see how how all these characters were set up. It gives you a little bit more context between the way they interact with each other. But it's it's not necessary. I mean, if you go to this movie without having seen the previous ones, you'll still be able to enjoy it and follow it just fine. It's it's self contained enough. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So those are my final thoughts. I enjoyed it. Um, I'll, I'll go to the next one. <laughs> Same here. Um... And yeah, I, I think this one's slightly better than the first. Or it, it's the one I can imagine rewatching more in the future. Because like, again, I, I said before, Avengers 1 is kind of a blur to me. Like, I feel like it takes place in just like three locations. Whereas this one has enough variety and, and different characters and whatever that I feel like it'll be a more enjoyable experience to go back and, and rewatch. I'm actually considering seeing this one again in theaters because I feel like the movie's so dense that there are other things to catch on to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, like, there is a lot going on. It's, it's, it's not, it's not um, confusing, but there is certainly a lot that 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 I could see watching multiple multiple times could could, could help you out. Uh, just kind of catching things you didn't notice before the first time, that kind of stuff. So yeah. Anyway, um, I think that concludes our uh, our podcast for today. Um, uh, next week, I don't know. I don't know. Do we have anything coming out next week, or is there, or is, or are or, or movies take, taking a break because Avengers? <laughs> yeah, Ex Machina is expanding and, and a couple other things, but I don't think anything new is really coming out. So I, you know, we might not unless we think of something to podcast on. We might not uh, be back until uh, Mad Max Fury Road. I, I'm just holding out for Mad Max. I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can't even. Actually, I'll, I'll admit one thing that kind of helped Avengers is I think I've been so psyched for Mad Max and. And Star Wars and all the stuff that like my excitement for Avengers kind of went down. So I think that's why uh, I might have a slightly higher opinion than some people's because like I wasn't I was hyped for other things. So I I kind of forgot to be excited about this movie. So then when I went in the theater, I was like, oh yeah, this is just awesome, you know? Yeah, I feel the exact same way. I I I, I wouldn't say I wasn't excited for it, but I was. There's so much. There's so many other films coming out that look amazing, and I'm just like, you know, I'm just I'm just waiting for the other movies to come out. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. Um, that's it. You can uh, check out our, subscribe to our channel for more episodes. We have plenty of them uh, from the past year. If you want to hear our thoughts on other films that came out in 2014 and 2015, uh, subscribe to us on, on Outside the Letterbox here on YouTube. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at, at Letterboxers. Stay up to date with us on Facebook. And um, yeah, we'll see you, if not next week, the week after that. <laughs>